So for anyone listening in, so I mean we are on this recording. Um, we're recording a mental health, um, the last mental health webinar series on building mental resilience. Uh, Maria Khan is an accredited counsellor, qualified supervisor and founder of Muslim Counselor and Physiotherapist Network, is that correct? Uh, uh, Muslim Counselor and Psychotherapist Network, yes. Psychotherapist Network. Um, so she'll be delivering our last mental health webinar and I'll let you take on from here. Okay, lovely. Well, thank you. First of all, um, just huge thanks, really, for inviting me um, to come and deliver this. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be covering today is what I came and delivered to your FOSIS conference last year at, at the workshop um, at, at your conference back in um, Manchester last year. And a lot of the feedback very much was around um, these are great tools and techniques to use while studying, um, through graduation, going for job interviews. This is going to help you from in on out throughout the rest of your life, essentially. But I think where a lot of you are placed right now in terms of studying, getting through uni, being graduates and go, getting into the job market, this is really, really important. This is, these are really important tools and techniques that you can start to apply. Um, so thank you really for inviting me back essentially to come and deliver this. Um, so, um, some, as I said earlier really, some of this is going to be very um, experiential and, and, and interactive. So I'd like to pose you some questions. Um, as you listen to this, if you can quickly grab pen and paper, um, there might be um, notes you want to take or equally um, just some answers to some questions that I'm going to pose just so that you see how that changes during the workshop yeah okay yeah so yeah are we good are we good to go with this then yeah so i'm going to pose you the, i'm going to pose you the first question um which is oh if i can let me just there we go my first question very simply is how are you i'm good and, yeah, great. So it's, 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 it's our, um, it's, it's literally our student during this workshop. So she's going to be answering and, go, and going along with those that are listening. Um, but, for those that, the, but for those of you that are listening, make a note of what you've written down. When I ask you, how are you? What is your default automatic response? Um, so Isma, you said, OK. Yeah. yeah. You said you were OK. Yeah. yeah. What's that really telling me? Or, what, what, or rather, have a think. What is what does that answer really tell you about yourself? How helpful is that of an answer? It, does that really tell you anything? No, does that really, really care how you feel? No, not really. Yeah. It, it, um, somebody's okay is again because it's so subjective. You're okay would be my I'm really happy. Or you're okay might be me feeling really rubbish or quite depressed. Yeah, it's so subjective. So the first tool and technique that I'm going to give you is what's called a scaling technique. And it's our scale. So at this scaling technique, you can use and apply it to so many questions that you want to ask yourself or ask of other people. Now, if I was to ask you the same question again, how are you? But instead, I say, how are you feeling on a scale of one to ten, where zero or one is the worst you've ever felt, and ten is is you feeling ecstatic, the best you've ever felt? Now, what? How would you answer on a scale of zero to ten? How are you feeling right now? I'd probably say an eight. Wow. Okay. So straight away, you went from an okay. Well, I couldn't really gauge what that meant to you. Mm -hmm. To now an eight, where we both now have a really good idea of how you're feeling. So straight away, you can start to see that the quality of your answer mm -hmm. is much more informative to me. But more importantly, it's informative to you. Um, so have a think about in asking yourself, and again, for those that are, that are kind of listening, listening to this, um, jot down then the number that you gave yourself. 
So um, if you were to ask yourself, how am I feeling? We're on a scale of 0 to 10. 0 is the worst I've ever felt up to 10 where it's the best I've ever felt. It's a great scaling question so that you can essentially check in with yourself. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit later on about why that's important to be able to check in with yourself. But essentially, um, this is the difference between asking a very generic question where perhaps we give those default automatic answers of, yeah, I'm fine, I'm OK, to actually being consciously self-aware of how you're feeling. So that tool is called scaling. And you can ask this um, and you can apply scaling to so many situations right before an exam. You might want to ask yourself, oh, how anxious am I? Where zero is no anxiety all the way up to 10, where I'm just full of full of anxiety, the worst anxiety I've ever felt. Or equally, you can ask yourself before um, or when you wake up in the morning, how happy do I feel? So it's a great tool to apply to any situation you find yourself in to be able to check in with yourself. So hold on to that as, as, as a tool or technique for yourself. We're going to um, add on to that knowledge a bit further on when we look at then why, why would that be helpful to you? Why is it important to know how we're feeling? But to move on, the next thing I would like to introduce you to is understanding our brains. Because for this seminar, for us to understand what mental resilience is and to build a positive mindset, at the very heart of this, or really at the very brain of this, is us knowing how our brains work. Because once we know how our brains work, we can then use our brain to help ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the brain is split into two hemispheres. We have the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. And this picture in front of you is a very helpful diagram to actually see that the two halves, our two hemispheres, have two very distinct roles. We have the right hemisphere, that is our creative side, and it is where all our emotions and our emotional thought and creativity lives. It's all to do with our thoughts, our dreams, our emotions, all our nonverbal language, mm -hmm. our creativity, when we're doing art or writing, it's where all our imagination comes from. And the key thing then also with the brain is that the right hemisphere controls the left side of our body, the left side motor skills, and vice versa. The left hemisphere controls the right side. So if we then move over and look at the left hemisphere, the left hemisphere is logic. It's all about analytical thought. It's about us being detailed orientated. It's about order and rational thinking and verbal or our verbal language. It's planning. It's maths and science and logic. So um, we need to recognize that this is how our brain is made up because it helps us then to understand how we process thoughts and feelings. And then we can then build mental resilience within us and create a positive mindset because we now can see that our brain is made up in this way. What's really interesting is that whenever we take in information from um, our external environment, um, you may not be aware, but that information first of all goes in into the right hemisphere of our brain first. So it goes through our emotional center first of our brain before going into the left hemisphere, which is where the logic and thought and rational thinking is, before it goes back into the right side of the brain and then we respond. And that happens in a millionth of a millisecond. Um, because, and it's important for us to know that because we have to understand that the information going into us then is going through this emotional right hemisphere before it even touches upon any logical or rational thinking before it hits back into the right hemisphere and then we respond. And the reason we need to know that that's, that's how our brains operate is to then recognise why perhaps at times we may become overly emotional or why our emotions may hijack 
our rational, logical um, thinking brain. And that's because, as I've said, the information passes through our right hemisphere first. And it's important for us to know that. So that some, again, some tools and techniques that I'm going to share with you today um, will make better sense to you knowing that this is how our brain is set up. So as we move on, in knowing that that's how our brain processes information and that at times because it passes through our emotional center first, something called emotional hijacking happens whereby then this right hemisphere takes control. Now, as we can see that picture in front of us, um, in which the right hemisphere is all the emotional thought and the left hemisphere is all rational thought. Imagine sitting in a car where one of those hemispheres is the driver and the other hemisphere is the passenger. And the thing with a driver and a passenger in a car is that only one of them can drive the car. So at any one time, only one of these hemispheres is in control, is in the driver's seat. And what can often happen is something called emotional hijacking in which that right hemisphere, where all our thoughts and emotions and imagination and, and creativity lives, that can take the driver's seat. And when that takes the driver's seat, what automatically happens then is that our left logical brain takes literal passenger seat or back seat. And so we cannot be logically thinking or have any rational thought at the forefront or or where we operate from or, or drive from when that right hemisphere is in the driver's seat. And so what can happen then is something called emotional hijacking. Um, and that's where then this right hemisphere is in charge. They're in the driver's seat. So knowing that that happens, knowing that this right hemisphere is in charge, we can then now engage in certain coping, um, rather not coping skills, but rather dealing skills, we can use some tools and techniques then to help us. And so for the next 10 50, or 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk you through, um, let's have a look here, I'm going to talk you through about seven different tools or techniques that can help you to um, slow down or shut down that emotional hijacking and to re-engage your left logical rational thinking brain so that that is what is driving you. So again, thinking back to the topic of today, that helps that helps us to build mental resilience because it allows us, or rather it allows our left logical brain to take control to go through and or not, and not experience this emotional hijacking. So this might be where your um, pen and paper might come in handy. I'm just going to talk you through then these seven different ways of helping yourself. So the very first one is called 7-Eleven breathing. Um, and the reason I'm calling this dealing skills rather than coping skills is because you are now dealing with your emotional hijacking. You are now dealing with heightened anxieties or heightened stress or when you feel as if your emotions are feeling overwhelming to you or getting the better of you. I don't want any, any of you out there to, to feel that you have to cope with um, emotional overwhelm or overload when you can actually do something very proactive here to actually deal with them. So the first one is called 7-11 breathing. And essentially, the reason it's called 7-11 breathing is because it's a technique of breathing in for the count of seven and breathing out for the count of 11. And the little bit of science behind this that I'll very briefly talk you through is that essentially on our breath in, we are engaging our internal systems, um, um, our um, sympathetic systems in which that's when we breathe in we're engaging in our stress systems when we breathe out we're engaging in our parasympathetic nervous system which is about relaxation so our count of seven in is stress our breath out at a count of 11 is relaxation now clearly 11 is a longer count 
than breathe, they've been severed. So your breath out is longer than your breath in. What that's what that actually tells us, what the message is that, that, that then is going to our sympathetic nervous system is one of, oh, I am I am engaging with my relaxation system for longer. I'm in relaxation mode longer than I am in stressful mode. Essentially, I am breathing out for longer than I'm breathing in. Over a five minute course of doing the 7-Eleven breathing, I will be breathing out much more than I have, uh, have taken breaths in, which means I have overridden my stress system because I have been in relaxation mode for longer over those five minutes. If we add up all the breaths out in five minutes, I have been breathing out within that five minutes longer than I have been breathing in, which immediately sends a message to our parasympathetic nervous system to say, oh, I can now be in relaxation mode. This 7-Eleven breathing technique has been proven to reduce anxiety significantly. If you practice this 7-Eleven breathing technique three times a day for 10 minutes. So if you sit somewhere relaxed, somewhere comfortable, somewhere safe, and if you can practice the 7-Eleven breathing technique for, 10, for a period of 10 minutes, three times a day, over time, it has been proven to reduce your base level of anxiety. Remember how I did the scaling technique earlier? If you're regularly scaling at a seven or an eight out of 10 on anxiety every day, then that's where you live um, at a, on a regular daily basis. The 7-Eleven breathing, te breathing technique alone has been proven to bring that, that scaling number down significantly. So as I said, try the 7-Eleven breathing technique three times a day for 10 minutes a day. For some of you, as you practice this, you may find that the count of seven or the count of 11 is too long for you. Don't worry too much about the numbers. Just make sure that your breath in is shorter than your breath out. So it may be three, five. So you're breathing in for three and out for five. Or you might be breathing in for five and breathing out for seven. Make the numbers work for you so that you're not counting too quickly. Or equally, don't count so slowly that the numbers then are causing you then not to actually take full, full breaths. So find a, a, a number, whether that's 3-5 breathing or 5-7 breathing or 7-11 breathing. Find a count of numbers that is comfortable for you. So that's the first cope and dealing skill that you've got. The second one is what we call step back and observe. Now, this again is where the scaling question can really help you, because in a, in a moment of feeling anxious or stressed or overwhelmed, that emotional hijacking can happen because that right hemisphere, your emotional center of the brain is active. It's in the driver's seat. By asking yourself a scaling question, how am I feeling right now on a scale of zero to 10? And, and asking for a number, what you are actually engaging in is a rational, logical approach to take a step back and observe, which re-engages your left hemisphere of your brain, which is then rational, logical thinking. So already we can start to see that some of these techniques are about overriding your right hemisphere by engaging in techniques that re-engage the left hemisphere. So by stepping back and observing, asking yourself as the scaling question, asking yourself, what am I feeling? Asking yourself, what do I need to do right now? Do I need to take some time out? Do I need to walk away from the situation or do I just need five minutes to myself? What you are doing is you are re-engaging your left hemisphere. The next five, I'm going to go through um, in, in, in detail. Um, and, and I will use further um, PowerPoint slides to go through this. So again, you may want to take notes for this. So the next tool I'm going to give you is called a regrounding technique. This is really important and this is a really useful tool when you feel that that emotional hijacking is taking place, when you feel overwhelmed by feelings. And this simple regrounding technique is in the moment Notice 
five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. By going through and re-engaging all your senses, you are regrounding yourself in your immediate environment and in working logically through that list, you again are putting your left hemisphere back in the driver's seat. You're engaging rational, logical thinking because you're engaging with all your senses. So just repeat or go through that again. The regrounding technique in a moment of feeling overwhelmed or anxious. Do these do these things. Notice five things you can see. Notice four things you can touch. Notice three things you can hear. Notice two things you can smell and notice one thing you can taste. And that's to re grounds you in that moment and re grounds you then in the environment that you're in. The next one that I want to talk about is called engaging your RAS. And that's that, that RAS stands for Reticular Activating System. And it it um, leads into then thinking positive thoughts. So this really is about building up your mental resilience and creating a positive mindset. Now, the reticular activating system, this is a part of our brain that we all have. And with the reticular activating system, what it does, if you imagine it to be a gatekeeper of your thoughts, we have thousands, millions of thoughts every day. But what the RAS does, a bit like um, when we're on like Instagram or on social media, we tag or on Facebook, we tag photos of people or, or things. Our brain, the RAS in our brain tags a certain information coming through that gate as significant. So whatever we deem significant, the RAS will mark it as significant. And what the reticular activating system then does is it will, but by making that particular thought or person or image or object significant, you're actually programming your brain to then look for it. Very often, this can happen when we're looking to buy something new or if you have just bought something new. Um, very often, it's in, if, you, if you're looking to buy a car or you're looking to buy a particular item for your wardrobe, you then might start to see it everywhere. Um, the, the car one is an obvious one because for a lot of people, um, they take time in choosing a car. They think about what colour. So you can all think now if you want to, whether you drive or not or, um, or what car you would love to be driving. If you picture that now in your mind, mind um, that image will come to mind and your RAS will have tagged it as significant. Now in tagging it as significant, you have now programmed your RAS to go out into the world and find it. So just as we walk down the street or drive around in our cars, we all of a sudden will be spotting that car over and over again. And it's not because all of a sudden there are more cars of that make and model and colour on the road, but it's because you have programmed your RAS, your brain, to pick it out, out of the thousands of other cars that you might spot. Now, the reason that this is important is because our brain loves to have those patterns loves to mark things as significant because it makes our brain then go into almost autocomplete. Um, and so when you have thoughts that you want to keep having or you want to have thoughts in which you are spotting that in the world around you, keep reminding yourself of them. If you're wanting um, to do well in an exam, Imagine what it's like to sit that exam and to pass it or sit that exam feeling good or imagine opening up that envelope or, how, or, or rather an email or, or blackboard how you receive your marks and imagine what it's like then to get that mark that you want. And this is where we then say we tag positive thoughts. Anything you want to see more of in your world or in your life, tag it as significant. If you want to be more positive, if you want to build mental resilience, then by tagging positive thoughts or positive statements about yourself, about your position, about your dreams, about what you want to go after in life, 
keep repeating them to yourself because you are reprogramming your brain to on essentially you're reprogramming reprogramming your brain on autopilot or on default to start spotting that in your life and so this is where people who have strong mental resilience get it from because they understand how the RAS works and they use it to their advantage. So just as a quick reminder, your RAS is the part of your brain that's the, that's the gatekeeper that is going to be on autopilot filtering all the information that you sift through every day. And it is going to be highlighting and, and picking out the thing that you think is significant. If you want to see more happiness, more positivity, more success in your life, start making those significant. Start telling yourself that that is important to you and that it's on its way and that you can see it happening for yourself. You are now programming your brain. This is crucial for any success in your life or for you to start working towards your dreams and goals, whether that is your current studying, whether that's you at graduation, whether that's you at um, looking for a graduate job or, or getting onto the career ladder. This is the heart of mental resilience in building up your self-esteem and a positive mindset. Essentially, the more you think, the more thoughts you have, the more you repeat thoughts, they become your core beliefs and your core beliefs are what's going to be driving your motivation and your energy on what you're going to be working towards in life. So you really do have a choice. So I hope that's another way to really be able to build up your mental resilience and really focus on the positives and the goals and the ambitions and the dreams that you have. At the bottom of this slide, I've also mentioned another tool or technique called the four D's. This is for anybody who worries a lot. It's a four step tool or technique to rid yourself of worry rather than letting those thoughts go round and round and round in your brain like a roundabout. Now that we know how the RAS works, we can start to see why somebody who is a worrier, they are stuck in a pattern of behavior and thought that their RAS, that that core belief, that that mindset is just on autopilot. So this is a way to break that vicious cycle. So a way to stop worrying is to do this technique. Put aside 20 minutes and I want you to write down all your worries. So set yourself a timer and for 20 minutes, write down all your worries onto a piece of paper. After 20 minutes, I want you then to go through that list and I want you to um, do these or answer these four questions for all those worries. Do I need to do something about this worry? Do I need to delay making a decision about it? Do I need to delegate it or do I need to ditch it? So I'll just run through those again. Four questions you need to ask about those worries on those paper, on your paper. Do I need to do something about this worry? Do I need to delay making a decision about it? Do I need to delegate it or do I need to ditch it? If you have a paper full, a page full of worries and you answer every and you ask every worry on your paper, all these four questions, by the end, you will have nothing left on that paper to do because those are the four things you can do about them. And in knowing what you can then do about it, you are then being proactive in your worry, proactive in finding a solution rather than sitting in the worry itself. So that, again, is another tool or technique that you can use to rid yourself of the worry. Again, let's think back to building a, a positive mindset or building mental resilience. This is a great technique for the rest of your life that if you're worrying about something, you now have control to do something proactive about it. The final one that I want to just run through quickly is something called the hot cross bun technique. Um, essentially, it is a way of reframing a, a situation in your life to make it, um, again, positive, to find a solution to it. And essentially, it is identifying four things to a situation that is causing you anxiety or stress. So whenever you have to think about 
an anxious or stressful situation coming up, I want you to think of the four, these four things around it. What are your thoughts to that situation? What are, your, what are you feeling in thinking of that situation? What are your physical sensations? And fourthly, what, are, what do you then do? What are your actions and behaviours based on your thoughts, feelings and physical sensations? Well, once you write those four areas down, I then want you to think again of that same situation. But now I want you to think of the same situation. But rather than think of the thoughts that you had the first time round, I would like for you to think of positive thoughts that, that you would like to think of that that you would like to have about that situation instead. So first time round, you're thinking of an anxious, stressful situation, and you might have lots of anxious, worrying thoughts come up about it. The second time round, I want you to imagine positive thoughts that you'd like to have about that same situation. When you have then come up with positive thoughts about that situation, I then want you to then think about how do you then feel when you think of those positive thoughts? What are your physical sensations in those having those feelings and thoughts? And then what would be the resulting outcome? Um, what would be the resulting behaviour and actions because of those positive thoughts, the associated feelings with those positive thoughts and how you feel physically in your body? You will then end up possibly having a completely different outcome of behaviour or action because you've changed your thoughts. So again, this is a very simple CBT hot cross bun tool or technique that can help you to change your thought about a situation that previously you thought very worrying, anxious or stressful thoughts about it. Because ultimately, your thoughts are going to lead to certain feelings. Those feelings are going to lead you to feel certain away in your own body. And because of your thoughts, feelings and physical sensations, it's going to accumulate to you then behaving and acting in a certain way. Again, if we take control and power over our thoughts, we can then change the outcome. So that's just another tool and technique that you can um, that can help you essentially to think more positively and also be in control of the resulting behaviour. Because it's far better to have positive thoughts about a situation that make you feel good, but then make you act and behave and, and do actions and behaviours in a way that are actually much more positive and healthy for you. So I've just gone through there seven different ways of thinking positively or using your mental, building your mental resilience so that you can take control over how you react and respond to situations. Very briefly, because I'm mindful of time, what I'm going to do then is just go through a couple of points about what is mental emotional resilience and why, why it is important. The reason really you're here and learning about this is because it's really important for us to build emotional resilience within us. It allows us to properly adapt to stress and adversity. It allows us to adapt to stressful situations or crisis. It builds within us the capacity to withstand stress and catastrophe. It allows us to remove any struggles or difficulties in coping them with your emotional reactions because you're no longer having to cope with your reactions. You are now dealing with them head on. It allows you to spring back emotionally from after suffering a difficult or stressful experience. Emotional resilience really does build you and give you the armour that you need in your life to deal with life's knocks and, and down times or difficult times. And ultimately, it allows you, you to give yourself self-care because all of this really is about how you can best look after yourself so that you can deal with life as it happens to you and as it unfolds for you. The reason I talk about self-care is because your self-care is ultimately you building a relationship with yourself to have a healthy relationship in order to promote and protect and maintain and improve your your um, health, your well-being, your wellness on a physical, emotional, 
mental, spiritual, physiological level. If in any one of those areas that feels depleted, overall you're going to be suffering in your well-being or your health. And that can, and then and self-care then can help you to prevent you feeling burnt out or overloaded. It can reduce negative effects of stress and it can really help you to consistently go through life, fulfilling your dreams, working on your goals and ambitions, getting to whether it's graduation or getting on that career ladder without you doing, doing it in a way that's actually detrimental to yourself. In the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to very quickly identify what your emotional needs are. And again, the importance of this is because what we what we are focusing on on mental resilience and emotional well-being. Sometimes we focus so much on what our mind or what state of mind we're in and whether that is healthy. It's also about how do we build up our well-being and our health through different ways. We all have emotional needs. And I'm just going to run through now very quickly what those emotional needs are. And we each need these. We need a feeling or a sense of connection, achievement, privacy, fun, meaning, status, control, community, attention, and security. They are all emotional needs which we each of us needs to feel. And if we imagine each of those being kind of inter internal beakers within us, within our sense of self, within our sense of well-being, we need to make sure that each of these beakers, each of these needs are being topped up or filled up. So out of those emotional needs, you may then feel that some of these are not being met. And that's where our mental resilience or our emotional well-being may be, that's why that might feel depleted. So whilst we build up our, our mental resilience, whilst we are building up our emotional health, these are the ways in which we build them up. So just as I've given you tools and techniques today around dealing directly with stress or with anxiety or feeling positive, those really are the end, end tech tools and techniques, but these are the things we can be doing every day to check in with ourselves to be able to maintain some optimum level of emotional and mental health well-being. Quickly run through them again. They are, and, and as I read through them, have a think about, am I meeting my need for these? Or if not, how can I meet them? So are you feeling connection, achievement, privacy, fun, meaning, status, control, community, attention and security? Out of all those emotional needs, have a think about which of those do I meet and I meet well? You know, you might spend a lot of time with friends or family. And it feels very fun. It feels that you are feeling connection or that you're feeling that you're getting attention or a sense of community. But maybe some of the others, such as privacy or status or control, you may not feel. So for each and every, each every one of you, this is going to be very individual and unique to you. Out of all these needs, have a think about which ones are being met, which ones am I meeting, and which ones perhaps those buckets or those beakers feel a bit empty, and how can I go out and meet those needs in me? If you can fill up all of these buckets or beakers and keep them topped up, that's going to help you feel that you, that, that's going to build your well-being, build up a sense of resilience in you, and then when you do feel stressed, or anxious or worried or you're coming or you're going through a difficult time a challenging time in life or you're coming you know we're coming up to exam time um the exam season these things are going to help you get through that time without feeling so overwhelmed so i'm hoping that from today you will have taken some tools and techniques um and also starting to think more widely also about your own emotional well-being in the sense that am I meeting my emotional needs? So I'm hoping that, that that helps you. It may be that in certain areas of your life you are meeting these needs. Ultimately, it is about creating a, your own individual self-care plan so that you're meeting your that you are creating your own sense of internal well-being. 
How somebody else looks after themselves and their self-care plan may look different to you. But it's really about it being unique and individual for yourself. So some of these emotional needs, you can you can Google this essentially. If you Google emotional needs, it will come up for you. It will give you lots of ideas. Equally, you can Google self-care plan or something that I use a lot with my students, what I use for myself, what I teach is something called a self-care wheel. If you go online and Google self-care wheel, it will come up with all the different areas in your life and, and gives you suggestions about where you can meet these needs and how you can um, do activities or engage in activities that helps build self-care, um, whether that's physically, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, personally or professionally, or, or for students educationally. So that was very much a whistle stop tour of going through emotional resilience, building mental resilience rather, building up emotional health. But there are so many um, apps online and tools and techniques that are also online that you can use. But the ones I've given you today really do work effectively because you also know the kind of science, literally the neuroscience behind it. You now know how you now know how your brains work for you to know why that breathing technique could work, why your RAS, your reticular activating system is so important. Think of it as your your default, your autopilot of what you what you tag as significant in your life. And if you can understand how that works, stop training your brain. You are you, it's amazing when you recognize and realize that you can actually train your brain and be in control of your brain a lot more than what we have been taught. So, as I said, it's the reticular activating system, the RAS, the RAS. Again, you can Google it, find out much more about it online. As I said, today was a whistle stop tour of lots of different tools and techniques and information. And I just hope that it helps you in, in any way that it can. So I thank you so much for listening.